thoughts first in terms of the uh, the passing of, of Nelson Mandela and uh, uh, his importance in not only in your life but of millions of South Africans and and fighters for uh, justice and freedom around the world. Well, in common with so many people uh, close to him, as well as those who were far off, uh, whether South Africans or internationally. Um, profound sadness. Of course, he was 95 and ill for some time, so I can't say it came as a surprise. In fact, we were prepared for this, but uh, whenever death strikes, it seems to come like a thief in the night and you're, you're shocked and you're torn up. Um, but actually, given the life he had led, and the tremendous example of that extraordinary life of um, struggle, of being involved in a collective leadership all his life, um, of facing the death penalty of all those years in prison, and then surmounting that and coming to a reconciliation with his enemies in terms of being able to acquire political power and set the country on the course of democracy, to have been close to him throughout all that obviously leaves a deep, deep pain and uh, a, a, an extraordinary gap in one's life. But like a father, and I'm not using that term uh, in, in, in a superficial way, when we say he was a father to us all, it, it was like the passing of one's father, because this was a leader in the best sense of the world, a leader who led by example and led from the front and could also lead from behind in terms of, of, of the way a, a shepherd makes sure the sheep are going in the right direction. Um, so one is actually filled with enormous strength at, at a very difficult and complex time internationally. It's a global problem and challenge that we all face, as well as very much in South Africa. One uh, digs deep down, as many South Africans are now, for the lessons that must be learned. So it's been a huge period of continued reflection of his life, his example, and uh, how we need to, to say farewell, but how we need to, to, to uh, move forward on that long walk to freedom, which he says doesn't come to an end, to be guided by the tremendous lessons of Nelson Rulichlachla Mandela's times and his life. Ronnie Castros, we have a good amount of time today to talk about the future of South Africa as well and the current president. But first, we'd like to go back in time to the time you first met Nelson Mandela. Tell us when it was, where it was, and what you both did together. Right. Uh, it was in uh, July 1962. It was in a safe house um, in the city of Durban, a, uh, a house that belonged to a, a worker. So it was rather small. The room that he was ushered into seemed to absolutely shrink in terms of the size of the man. Uh, he was far taller than I'd ever expected, having seen him only through photographs and having heard of him, obviously. But, you know, this is 62 I'm talking about, and I'd been in the, the movement for two years. And in the uh, armed wing of the ANC that he f helped form, and that's from Conto Isiswe, or MK for short, uh, so he was our commander-in-chief. And at the young age of 23, I found myself uh, as part of the command of a province, the Natal province, now called KwaZulu-Natal. And we weren't expecting him. We knew it was an important meeting, but we didn't know who we would be meeting. And there were many a leader. Uh, we weren't short of, of leaders. Um, when he strode in, he was quite stern and grim in terms of the times. 
a little bit of uh, joking came in a little later on, but Mandela had just got back to South Africa having slipped out um, and labelled the Black Pimpernel because he had gone underground the year before when he led a big strike, a national strike in May 1960. Uh, that was May 1961. That was brutally put down by the police. And with Sharpeville and the the way they, they put that strike down, these were part of the catalysts which brought about the end of non-violent struggle and the formation of of a, a, a new method of struggle and a new organization. So he had been out of the country, he'd been, as we came to learn later, um, and he let on a little bit about this in his discussions with us for military training. It happened to be in Morocco. Uh, this was the base of the Algerian FLN at the time, where things were really coming to a head in that country. He'd been to Ethiopia. He had met with African leaders. He had canvassed them about this new form of struggle in South Africa. And I think famously he had been to London and the Houses of Parliament to, to spread the message and galvanize the anti-apartheid movement. But his meeting with us was essentially to get reports from us about our work and how we were accomplishing our tasks our mission in terms of setting up underground cells in our province, one of four provinces of South Africa at that time, um, and the beginnings just at the end of the previous year, so something like six, seven months previously, of our first sabotage actions, our first operations, which as leaders in our province we had participated in personally. And of course we were busy training other cadres of the underground, setting up the cells, setting up the machinery, preparing explosives. Uh, we, we were to, as a result of his, his arrest just a couple of weeks later um, to actually, let me say, liberate rather than steal half a ton of dynamite from a road construction company, which meant that the um, actions of that sabotage phase of our struggle was on the point of really carrying some dramatic operations. Um, the first operations were rather based on the kind of homemade kitchen type chemicals that that people have read about in the anarchist cookbook or you learned a little bit about at school. But uh, we were very, very serious and committed and believed that we would we would really win, that this armed struggle would help to galvanize the oppressed people and um, fill the enormous gap left by the banning earlier of the Communist Party, but then in 1960, of the ANC and the Pan-Africanist Congress. And Mandela listened absolutely intently as we briefed him, possibly for a full hour. Um, he showed no expression. It was just that very serious mask of a face. And uh, when we finished, he put a number of questions to us and then gave us a briefing about what he had been doing outside the country and then discussed the, the tasks that lay ahead. It was then that there was a little bit of the jocular Mandela that appeared. I mean, this is like two hours without him smiling. We might have drunk a little bit of tea and water in that period. It was winter, but Durban can be rather clammy and hot. Um, and he said to us in that inimitable voice of his, Boys, he called us. Um, I was the youngest. Billy Nyer was there, and Koenig and Glovo, Eric and Charlie, the other three members of the command, were probably 10 years or so, 15 years older than me. But he said, Boys, you've got to train, you've got to be physically fit in terms of the operations, painstaking, reconnoitering of an objective. And he um, encouraged us to read as much as possible from international literature, um, from books like um, Hemingway's um, Farewell to Arms about 
the Spanish Civil War to the Che Guevara material, um, Soviet partisans, the Cypriot struggle, and very importantly, I'll never forget uh, the Mau Mau struggle or the struggle of Kenyan land freedom army. And he said to us, study African resistance, know how the struggle in Africa the armed struggle against colonialism in Africa has been inspired and motivated and its successes, its problems and its failures. And of course that of the Algerian FLN was very much to the fore. Um, as a 23-year-old dame, I possibly wanted to show off. I was at university, I was something of an athlete and I was in the cross-country club. And I, I said to him, oh, um, we didn't call him Madiba in those days. Uh, his clan name, that came much, much later. Comrade Mandela, um, I, I'm training very hard with the running club. Uh, and he said, oh, yes, and uh, are you good at long distance? Because that's what we need, my boy. And I said, sure, and I'm going to train for the Comrades Marathon. And he joked about how at that particular term was for the race, uh, which up till that time only whites could participate in. And uh, he said to me, you've got to train very, very hard. And uh, we joked a little bit about that, had he, he left. And within, I think it was in just over a week, the dreadful, dreadful news uh, arrived that Mandela had been arrested on that road from Durban to Johannesburg, a tremendous setback. Um, so that's something of that first event, that first occasion I met him.